guys, and welcome back to today's deep dive. This is going to be our second week in our new series of what was the world like that Jesus was entering into when he was born. Um, if you missed last week's, I would encourage you to pause this one and go back and watch our first week as it kind of leads into what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so to get us started, Josh, where kind of in the Bible does it talk about Jesus's, Jesus being born as like, a, um, not necessarily as a prophecy, um, but how, where does yeah, it describe it in event. the Bible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the Gospels are the sort of biography of Jesus's life. And Matthew and Luke mm -hmm. both have uh, birth narratives, uh, but being written for different people at different times by different people, uh, we get two different perspectives of uh, the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So Matthew uh, was a disciple of Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, and he was writing uh, a little bit more to a Jewish audience, okay. and Luke was a, histor a Greek historian who traveled with Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a doctor. And he was writing, trying to make this Jewish faith as, as accessible as possible to this Gentile audience. Mm. And so uh, there's, a, you know, two very different backgrounds mm -hmm. going into the writing of this. So there's a lot of different mm -hmm. uh, nuances between these two different birth stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, Matthew... Um, follows when you read something of a sort of about uh, one of Jesus's parents, Matthew follows Joseph's experience, mm -hmm. where Luke follows Mary's experience. Okay. Um, and there's uh, Luke is is also very. Uh, w there's several themes throughout Luke that he's really trying to make people aware of, and one of them was. Jesus cares about the people society doesn't. Hmm. And we see this very early on where Matthew tells the story of the wise men. Hey, Jesus was recognized even outside of Israel hmm. as being important. Mm -hmm. Jesus was recognized by these, these foreign wise men as being the birth, a king being born. Mm -hmm. And so... Matthew's perspective is focusing on these being recognized by arguably important people. Mm -hmm. Luke talks about how the angels came to shepherds, and shepherds were kind of like the nobodies. Mm -hmm. Maybe a maybe a similar job description today might be like janitor, where okay. we're like, we appreciate you. Uh, like no one is like, hey, janitors shouldn't exist, but at the mm -hmm. same time, no one's like, hey, let's go hang out with a bunch of janitors. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of if there was a role in today's society that still had a little bit of stigma of being uh, not a um, complex job or a mm -hmm. job for uh, people who didn't interact well with others or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that was kind of how shepherds were viewed. Okay. Uh, janitors are awesome, by the way. <laughs> but uh, the so shepherds, this sort of like you work outside of town with the animals, you smell like the animals, you live with the animals, uh, and the angels coming to them is is right in line with Luke saying, "Hey, everyone's important, regardless of what society says about them." Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot, of, and we'll touch a little bit more as we go deeper into how some of these differences play out. But mm -hmm. an, one of the, the, the real big ones is that we don't start talking about Jesus mm -hmm. until chapter two of Luke. Mm -hmm. So chapter one, uh, Luke talks about John the Baptist a lot. Okay. Um, it starts out talking about uh, John the Baptist being, uh, his birth being foretold to his dad, mm -hmm. and his dad was a, uh, from the tribe of Levi, he was a priest, and priests would sort of serve in rotation at the temple, where it's like, oh, this this group of priests was now serving, and then when their service was done, a different group of priests would come in, and they would go home, or whatever, mm -hmm. and so this was while he was serving at the temple, um, he went in to, to light incense, and the uh, of, he was given a vision where Gabriel, the angel, 
uh, who's named in this passage, comes to him and tells him about uh, his barren wife mm -hmm. uh, having a kid who is John the Baptist. And then it's after that that uh, Gabriel comes to Mary mm -hmm. to talk about Jesus being mm -hmm. promised. Yeah. And so uh, after this, Mary goes to uh, John the Baptist's mom, her mm -hmm. cousin, uh, to talk about it because the angel was like, hey, and as a sign, you know, your barren relative is also having a kid. Right. And John the Baptist's birth and the prophecy carries us through the end of chapter one of Luke. Mm -hmm. So before chapter, like the first chapter of Luke promises Jesus, mm -hmm. but we don't even get to him. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is big because John the Baptist in his ministry mm -hmm. was well known in Judah, okay. in that area. Mm -hmm. It wasn't well known to the Roman world. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Turkey didn't care. <laughs> Greece didn't care. Mm -hmm. And so Luke is wanting to help people understand the perspective of, you know, in the book where I come from, what was the Jewish people's expectation and what was their reaction to Jesus? Mm -hmm. And looking at the ministry of John the Baptist, how he sets up the stage for Jesus, what he is leading the Jewish people towards to be ready for Jesus, mm -hmm. really... Um, helps the Gentiles sort of get a picture of, of what was going on in Judah when Jesus was acting on the stage. Hmm. And so, you know, with Matthew, um, Matthew was really focusing in on, on Jesus. The people around him already mm -hmm. had all this, this background because they were living it. Mm -hmm. And so we, we get a bit more of this insight into um, the world in Judah and what was going on religiously before Jesus started his ministry because Luke gives us so much insight into what was going on with John the Baptist. Hmm. And so he starts the first chapter by leading into that. Okay. Um, so we talked about Matthew and Luke a little yeah. bit. Why don't we necessarily get this birth account of Jesus in the Gospels of Mark and John? So John was written last. Mm -hmm. And John already saw the other three Gospels, and he wasn't trying to recreate them. Mm -hmm. He was trying to broaden the picture with his personal experiences of Jesus and what he taught. Mm -hmm. And he was, John was written to complement the existing three Gospels. Okay. It wasn't meant to just be its own biography. Okay. And so John didn't feel the need to write about Jesus' birth mm -hmm. because it had already been written about. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, there's two different uh, potential reasons why we don't have one in Mark. Mm -hmm. And one is that Mark was written to a church being persecuted. And Mark is very direct, very to the point. Here's who Jesus was, and here's what you need to know about him to be saved. And it's just really um, trying to gun through, you know, not a lot of flourishes, and it's just really trying to get to the point of sure. the good news. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, maybe hearing about him as a baby mm -hmm. doesn't contribute to this persecuted church uh, no, being able to hand someone something and say, this is what you need to know to be saved. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other potential, and this is certainly a potential, is that uh, when you had a scroll, mm -hmm. the, the parts that would deteriorate first were the end parts that were bound to the wood, that were wrapped up around the wood. Mm -hmm. And so Luke cuts off and doesn't have the same uh, embellished resurrection account mm -hmm. as the other Gospels. Mm -hmm. And so a thought is, if Mark was on one of these, these scrolls, mm -hmm. uh, the parts that would deteriorate mm -hmm. would end up being the resurrection account and the birth account because they are on the ends that are directly being touched by the wood. Mm -hmm. And so some people think that the reason that we have sort of a truncated mark where we start and Jesus is already starting in ministry mm -hmm. and we end uh, pretty abruptly after like his death mm -hmm. is that those end parts maybe got uh, deteriorated and rather than try to recreate them, we just copied what we had. Hmm. That's interesting. Um 
we talked a little bit about the first chapter in um, Luke, and I know from just reading Matthew when growing up, and to be honest, a few months ago, reading Matthew, I would skip over the first chapter of Matthew because yeah. it just listed so many names, and I just didn't quite understand. Yeah. So what is that importance of the first chapter in Matthew with the genealogy of Jesus? Yeah, and Luke also touches on the genealogy in chapter 3. Okay. But the genealogies were so important to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. We talked about last week how the Jews had been exiled mm -hmm. and they had come home. And what was really important was that uh, when God was like laying out the promised land and he's like, this tribe goes here, this tribe goes here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got... Uh, land based on your family, based on like the population of your tribe. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, different tribes uh, had, uh, primarily Judah and uh, Levi had different roles in that only Levites could be priests, mm -hmm. only Levites descended from uh, the line of Aaron, specifically the line of Phineas, one of his uh, kids, mm -hmm. uh, could be high priests. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then uh, the kings would come from the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. And so the there was a very clear um, importance on who your parents were. There was so much uh, importance about where in these this huge backlog of God's promises in the mm -hmm. Old Testament, where do I fit in? Because the genealogy of where I fit in and all these promises mm -hmm. is really important to me, uh, not strictly socially, but also religiously. Mm -hmm. I want to know what tribe I'm in. I want to know, you know, what land my ancestors had. I want to know uh, what my responsibilities are. If I'm if I'm a Levite and I'm not doing priestly work, that's I would prefer not to, you know, neglect that. Mm -hmm. If I'm not a Levite, I shouldn't be doing priestly work. Sure. And so there was a huge importance in the Jewish culture at this time to know your genealogy hmm. and know it just to an excruciating detail. Okay. Such that uh, Paul in 1 Timothy uh, 1 4 talks about, uh, he's talking about teachers who are being, are introducing unproductive topics in the church. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things he talks about is, along with like bad doctrine, is really focusing on these endless genealogies mm -hmm. rather than just living how God wants us to live. Mm -hmm. And so even Paul is addressing like, hey, this focus on genealogies mm -hmm. isn't the gospel, isn't what's important. Mm -hmm. And so, but culturally, it, it was super important to know to if you could trace your, your line from Abraham to you, mm -hmm. that was a big deal. Okay. And so uh, the Jewish authors, uh, or Jewish readers would want to know, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. And when they asked, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. They weren't talking about an individual. They were including that family tree. Mm -hmm. Now, Luke and Matthew, their genealogies differ a bit. Okay. And sometimes that's hand-waved away as one is uh, Joseph and one is Mary. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a bit of a, a, a leap just because it sounds like the, uh, it sounds like both of them are talking about Joseph. Okay. Some people say, well, maybe uh, Mary's dad adopted Joseph because he didn't have any kids. That's, I mean, that's a stretch. Like we're kind of making stuff up here that might be true, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. we don't have any evidence. <laughs> Another thing is maybe uh, Joseph's dad, uh, or Joseph's mom's, first husband, mm -hmm. died before he had a kid. Mm -hmm. So Joseph's dad, who was a brother to his mom's first husband, married her in a, a Leverite marriage, mm -hmm. which is so that the first kid would technically be the descendant of the dad that died, so that that family line would live on. Gotcha. And it was this, this we read about it um, in the Old Testament, and so that's that's a system where it's like a line wouldn't just be wiped out mm -hmm. because uh, the brother would, uh, like an unmarried brother, the unmarried closest relative mm -hmm. would marry the wife and the first kid mm -hmm. would be considered the kid of the person who died. Okay. Uh, genetically, it was not the kid of the person who died, but legally it was. Okay. And so some people have said, well, 
maybe, you know, this is the case and it's, you know, one of the genealogies is his biological dad and one of them is like the his non-biological like legal dad or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's that's also a stretch. Mm -hmm. Like it's all of these things are conjecture without <laughs> and and it, they're conjecture because like we can't say yes, but we also can't say no. It's like mm. mm -hmm. um, finally another thought is that one is a legal genealogy <laughs> and like one is a biological genealogy. Okay. In the sense of of you know inherent inheriting specifically the throne of David because mm -hmm. one goes through. Uh, David to Solomon to you know etc. Another one goes from David to Nathan who wasn't a king, mm -hmm. and then and then goes off that way. So so there's uh, a contention like or an argument that one is a sort of legal like legally who who am I inheriting from, mm -hmm. and the other is biologically what ge whose genes am I inheriting? Yeah, and so um, a really big thing to remember here is that these books were written at the time mm -hmm. in the culture where the people read these two accounts mm -hmm. and they weren't freaking out. Mm -hmm. They weren't like, oh my gosh, this word looks different than this word, mm -hmm. therefore all of this is bogus. Mm -hmm. So there was a cultural understanding that made these two genealogies make sense together. Okay. Um, and, you know, I throw threw out a couple of of possibilities, mm -hmm. but the the gospels aren't trying to tell us how they sync up. They're just giving us these details. Sure, that's uh, helpful. Yeah, and the the genealogy. Uh, we'll come back to remember this for something later. <laughs> um, so we've talked a little bit about just like the reasoning, the history behind the four gospels, where we're kind yep. of seeing Jesus being born. Um, but can we talk a little bit now about the events that were happening, like, in the world, right, yeah. what our series is, yeah. of the world that Jesus was entering into. So what are some of those events that you'd like to share sure. with these students, with so, our viewers? Uh, we're going to kind of skip over, like, some of the stuff in the John the Baptist uh, okay. account because... Um, it kind of will make sense in the bigger picture if you work backwards. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to start with uh, Luke 2. Okay. Uh, so Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the entire world should be mm -hmm. registered, sort of this census. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Caesar Augustus obviously inherited from Julius Caesar. He was the Roman Empire emperor. Mm -hmm. And uh, Luke records this is the first uh, census that happened when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Mm -hmm. So everyone went to be registered. And there's there's a little bit of debate about was Quirinius the governor of Syria while Herod the Great was alive? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some uh, discussion about, you know, how do these this timeline match up? So, mm -hmm. um, but it, there's no, like, clear, like, oh, this is a misspoke this is being misspoken or this is clearly an error mm -hmm. or, oh, this is clearly right. And so I, it's just, you know, the records from the time aren't such that I can be like, here's a clear answer about how that works out. Mm -hmm. um, so, but here we have a census and all who went to be registered each, like everyone went to their own town mm -hmm. for this census. Mm -hmm. Now that was weird. Not, the Roman world didn't work that way. Mm -hmm. uh, when when the census was taken, it was it was kind of like today, except with less writing on mailed in letters and more a guy going door to door and being like, you know, who lives here and what do you own? Hmm. Now, uh, just a little bit ago, I was like, hey, remember that thing that we just literally <laughs> talked about? So uh, Rome was very much uh, if you people are following us, are paying us our taxes, are obeying us, we don't care if you do things your way as long as your way is for the benefit of Rome. <laughs> and here we have a people who are obsessed about their genealogies, about their families. Mm -hmm. And what makes sense to me is that the discrepancy between this isn't the way it was done elsewhere in the Roman world, and this is what we read about in the Bible, is that uh, the Jewish 
uh, desire to understand our family units, to have this rigorous genealogy, mm -hmm. that it totally makes sense that with Jews, it wouldn't be, oh, yeah, I live here, and is this your residence? No, my like, I'm from Bethlehem. Mm. Oh, wh when did you move from Bethlehem? Oh, like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you're from here. No, I'm from Bethlehem, <laughs> right? And so there's this this very rigorous of of letting letting the people do it their own way as long as it was productive, mm -hmm. and the Jewish people really wanting to keep tabs on individual tribes, individual families, and so saying that this Luke two account is how censuses were taken across the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. that's not historical. Mm -hmm. But to say that this Luke 2 account is how censuses were taken in a Jewish culture mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a ton of, of extra uh, biblical sources about what specifically this looked like, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not a... Um, it's not a contradiction between the Bible and history mm -hmm. because we're not, the Bible isn't saying this is how senses were taken everywhere in the Roman world, mm -hmm. which is what some people say to try to disprove the Bible. They're like, hey, sure. look, in 104 BC, this is how Egyptians took censuses, and it doesn't look like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's within a Jewish culture with Jewish uh, importance on genealogy, family unit, family history. Mm -hmm. It makes sense that they would choose to do the census this way mm -hmm. because of their just extreme importance on genealogy. Hmm. So uh, he went from Galilee mm -hmm. to uh, the city of David because he was from the line of David. Sure. Um, now, and he went with Mary. And I'm going to skip just a little bit ahead where... Uh, he laid them in a manger because there was no room for them in an inn. Mm -hmm. uh, for starters, I want you to get the idea of that like wooden manger that's like X shaped with like the little like Kay. V. Yeah. And, and like you're picturing it. Yeah. Forget it. Okay. It was just like a stone block that just mm -hmm. had like a, a divot carved into it. Hmm. Right. And so I, wood was not. Yeah, it's a very rocky terrain. You don't just use wood for anything. Okay. Uh, if it's going to be used for a long time, you generally use stone. Okay. Such that Joseph, uh, craftsman is a better interpretation than carpenter. Okay. And more than likely, he worked with stone, not wood. Hmm. Uh, just because, you know, you didn't use a lot of wood. Sure. You used so much stone. Because that's what they had. Huh. Um, so... Uh, yeah, just think big rock right. <laughs> slab with like a, a divot carved into it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, oh, if I put them here, it's not going to roll out. Okay. <laughs> uh, but there was no room for them at the end. Mm -hmm. So not only being caring, caring about their genealogies, they were a very um, family-oriented culture such that if you had a relative coming into town, mm -hmm. it wasn't even a... a ambiguity about whether or not they were staying with you like they were hmm. welcome in hmm. and so for the the uh, Joseph and Mary to not only not have room in an inn but have to even look for room in an inn mm -hmm. shows that they were being sort of rejected hmm. by Joseph's family gotcha. now and that's that's likely because uh, Mary has been pregnant longer than they've been married sure uh, and so you see that Joseph's family is not on board with what they assume has happened, hmm. and they are sort of ostracizing them as a result. Right. Um, then we get into the shepherds, which I've already talked about a bit. And then uh, in the Luke account, it talks about uh, Jesus being presented at the temple. Mm -hmm. So uh, the firstborn son was uh, presented at a temple mm -hmm. and a sacrifice was given. And it shows that through all of this, Joseph and Mary are going through all of the proper mm -hmm. Jewish uh, customs, Jewish rites, um, mm -hmm. Jewish law mm -hmm. about uh, 
dedicating rate, like following the law in regards to Jesus. Yeah. Jesus isn't just given, you know, by the Holy Spirit to a virgin, right. but like everything about his life, even before he had a say in it, mm-hmm. was being done properly. Hmm. Um, so uh, we're going to jump ahead a bit because the Matthew account uh, doesn't really start as quickly in that, there we go, in that Matthew talks about Jesus being born. Mm-hmm. And then it talks about the wise men coming. Yeah. And there's not necessarily a needed immediacy for <laughs> that. Uh, the, there's a degree to which we don't want to push the birth of Jesus back too far. Yeah. Because Herod the Great died mm-hmm. in uh, 6 BC okay. or 4 BC. And it, this now says 4. Okay. So... Uh, <laughs> So if we push it back too far, then that, uh, or if we make it, push the wise men's arrival too far, then Herod's yep. dead and he can't talk to them. Okay. So uh, some people say three years. I don't know. Um, but the important thing is that uh, it happened before 4 BC because Herod is there. Mm-hmm. And so these wise men come from the east and they say they saw a star. Mm-hmm. Now, was that star like a floating thing that they were following and that like showed them where to go? Like that's a lot of the yeah. cartoons I grew up with. Right. Uh, that would be a pretty significant astronomical event that like we would kind of expect people to notice a moving star like that. Right. Because <laughs> like once nighttime hit, your only recreational activity was watching the stars pretty much. <laughs> Uh, th- I mean, there was no Netflix. It was <laughs> stars. So, the but there's there's a couple of of different people who are there's a couple of different ideas mm-hmm. about um, what they could have been interpreting. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Jupiter uh, is named after the Roman god who is the king of the gods, mm-hmm. that planet, and has sort of been associated with sort of the king planet and like. There's a point in around 6 BC when it's like in the constellation uh, of the ram. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, you know, if the ram is Judah and there's a king in Judah because Jupiter's in it, like, <laughs> let's go see what that, that's about. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's um, so like cases for this is an interpretation of astrological events. Yeah. And because of the consistency of our universe, we can like right. go like – there's software to go back in time, essentially, and see where things were in the sure. night sky then. Sure. Um, but, it, I mean, it, it all comes back to there are multiple explanations that make sense, but mm-hmm. we aren't being given the precise, like, this is it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But what I want to focus on a little more is Herod, because Herod is a significant figure yep. in this. Mm-hmm. So Herod the Great... Uh, 37 BC to 4 BC, uh, and he did a ton of building projects. Yeah. If there was something built, if there were like a lot of the structures that were in Israel during the time of Jesus were built during uh, Herod's reign, because I mean, there were just so many immense building projects. He was mm-hmm. appointed by Rome mm-hmm. to, to lead this area. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of the, the area of Israel. Mm-hmm. And because he was appointed by Rome, he, uh, the people weren't super enthused about, like, they weren't like, he's our king. Mm-hmm. He's like, he's our king. Hmm. Uh, and so they were, he didn't want to lose the favor of the people. Because mm-hmm. if he lost the favor of people, he would lose the favor of Rome. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to lose the favor of Rome, obviously, because then he would be deposed anyway. Right. And so when the wise men came up to him and they're like, hey, we heard about this new king, that set off so many red flags. It set off red flags because he was being appointed king. He wasn't, like, 
ancestrally the mm-hmm. undisputed king. Mm-hmm. It set off flags because Rome wouldn't like a king that wasn't appointed by Rome. Mm-hmm. It set off flags because if this newborn king mm-hmm. won the people over, mm-hmm. then that would cause huge problems for him. Sure. And so when we see that uh, later on, uh, he planned to kill yep. whoever this newborn king was. Right. It's not just out of this petty, like, oh, I want to be king and I want my kid to be king. It's like, a, mm-hmm. if this is a king, mm-hmm. the whole system falls apart. Yeah. If this is a legitimate king, the entire system implodes. Hmm. And, you know, if, if this king doesn't die, like, we have a civil war. Hmm. Like, there's, there's a lot of, of, of political significance that uh, just the, the most, the easiest way to deal with is just, well, let's just, let's just kill him. Hmm. And, and human life was not viewed that, as that expensive. There was a lot hmm. of... Of death, yeah. And to highlight that, we're actually going to talk about. Uh, oh, so uh, G- Joseph is informed. Hey, Herod is just going to you know kill all these kids. Right. You should go to Egypt, hmm. and so they do. And so when Herod kills all these kids, hmm. uh, Jesus isn't there. Mm-hmm. Now, af- and they stay in Egypt until Herod the Great dies. Mm -hmm. And then when Herod the Great dies, his kingdom is split up. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to talk about his son. So Herod, what happened is Herod the Great, uh, over the entrance of the temple, put a golden eagle. Mm -hmm. And that was viewed as blasphemous. Uh, Maybe it was a symbol to Rome. I mean, it probably was a symbol to Rome. But it was... uh, Nevertheless, it was a carven image in the temple. And so like two teachers and like 40 students, they're like, that's blasphemous. We're tearing it down. Mm -hmm. And so Herod the Great is like, hey, you tore that down? Well, now you're burned to death. Mm -hmm. And so, and then he proceeded to do the convenient thing and die. (laughs) And so his son, who was like stepped into that role, he was like, hey, I need to go be appointed officially Mm -hmm. by Caesar. But... Obviously, there needs to be some governing now. Right. And the people were, he had sort of this like public forum where he's like, yes, I'll lower your taxes. And, oh, you think, uh, here's the thing. Herod was the one who was appointing the high priest in the system, which is another reason why Jews were so vehement against Roman rule is that they Mm -hmm. wanted the high priest to be, Mm -hmm. you know, as appointed by God or by them, not by. So. They were like, oh, here's the high priest. Can you replace him with a better high priest? He's like, yes, I can do that. (laughs) And then they're like, hey, can you take the people responsible for burning those teachers and those those youths and kill them? Mm -hmm. He's like, ooh, I don't know about killing people for following Herod's orders. Mm -hmm. And then he took off and to have his own you know, because end of that session or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the people were slowly getting riled up. It was over Passover, so there were a ton of Jews in Jerusalem for Passover. Mm -hmm. And they they were weeping over, like, the deaths of these people and slowly getting more and more riled up. Mm -hmm. So he's like, I should do something about this. He sends soldiers, sends a general to try to, like, talk with them, try to get them to come to some sort of, like, stand still until he can get officially appointed and deal with some stuff Mm -hmm. and they stone those soldiers Hmm. and then they just carry on with the their passover stuff and he was not having that right so he sent in the army and three thousand people died very early on in his reign Mm -hmm. and so when uh we see that uh joseph comes out of egypt uh it says but when he heard that Archelaus, mispronouncing that probably, but that's <laughs> Herod's son, was reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there, and being warned by a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. <laughs> so, came down to Bethlehem for the census, was there for a bit, left because of Herod, mm-hmm. and then when he came back, he skipped over Judah and went back to where he was originally when we started in Nazareth, mm-hmm. because uh, what happened is... Uh, Archelaus was given like Judah, Samaria, and then uh, I want to say 
Antipater was given the sort of the Galilee region. Mm -hmm. And then I think Philip was given like the Golan Heights region. Okay. And so his, uh, Herod's son, his kingdom was split up. Gotcha. And so he went to a part that didn't have the guy that just killed 3,000 people on practically his first day. Hmm. So. <laughs> wow. Uh, and so, yeah, the uh, Herod, what, what happened eventually to sort of lead in is that uh, Archelaus was just not great. He lasted until 6 AD. And when the people were like, hey, could we maybe get like some sort of like Roman prefect or something like some sort of Roman over, instead of this guy? Because this guy's the worst. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's like, uh, that's when you get Roman governors like Pontius Pilate mm -hmm. uh, governing this area. Yeah. And, but you still read about Herod later on. And so there was this t role of what's called ethnarch. Okay. Eth from ethnicity, narc, like monarch. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you don't rule a, a kingdom, you rule a ethnic people group. Mm -hmm. And so when we read about sort of like when Paul in Acts, he's like, well, you're being sent to Herod, and then you're being sent to this Roman guy, and then you, there, there's this back and forth because neither of them want to like deal with him, want to sentence him to death for religious things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of this, this like... Oh, well, he's in your kingdom. Oh, well, he's your ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And so this sort of play between like... Gotcha. Uh, political... Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. So that's a speed run <laughs> of just what are some things yeah. in the first narrative account of yeah. Jesus' birth. Yeah. Um, join us next week for our final piece into this series of what the world was like that Jesus was entering into. See you guys next week. Bye.